The Lord be with you. The word of the Lord comes to us today in this virtual way on the first Sunday after Pentecost, also celebrated as Holy Trinity Sunday, which is what we'll celebrate today. Today we remember that our God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, but one God. That's a mystery, even to all Christians. We don't know how God can be three persons, but only one God. But that's what we confess, because that's what the Bible teaches. And we thank the Father that he created all things. We thank the Son, Jesus, that he redeemed us by dying on the cross. We thank the Holy Spirit for bringing us to faith and keeping us in the faith. Let's uh, begin with our opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. With true hearts, confess together that we, through sin sinful thoughts, careless words, and loveless deeds, have transgressed God's righteous law and deserve his punishment now and eternally. Almighty God, merciful Father, we acknowledge our sinful nature 
and repent of our sins in thought and in word and in deed. For the sake of Jesus, grant us your forgiveness, so that as your redeemed people, we be fit places for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and to serve you in time and in eternity. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the Collect of the Day. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear now the word of the Lord. The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday after Pentecost, also known as Holy Trinity Sunday, is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, the sixth chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join together in the gradual for these Sundays after Pentecost. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. On your wondrous works I will meditate, and I will declare your greatness. Our second reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter. This is a continuation of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost to all those in Jerusalem. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, 
The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join together in the verse of the day. Alleluia. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The Athanasian Creed that we are about to confess is one of the three creeds that all Christians everywhere on earth confess. We believe that this is, these are essential things to the Christian faith. And so uh, one cannot be a Christian unless they confess uh, together with us this creed. These are called the three ecumenical creeds. That means of all Christians everywhere. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, both of which we say regularly together, and then also this Athanasian Creed, which we say uh, about uh, once a year in church, uh, mostly because of its length. But we especially use it on Trinity Sunday because uh, it emphasizes the three in oneness of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this Athanasian Creed, we speak about the Catholic faith, spelled with a lowercase c. And the word Catholic means worldwide, and so that's what we're talking about is all Christians everywhere. We confess now the Athanasian Creed. 
Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated, or three infinites, but one uncreated, and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty. And yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Christian faith to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made, nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity.
But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, and less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one, Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of, of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming all people will rise again with their bodies, and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good, that is, believing in Jesus, will enter into eternal life, and those that have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to start out today with a card trick. All right, let's do a card trick. This is going to be a little bit tricky because you're not here to actually, when I tell you to pick a card, to actually point to a card for me. So we're going to have to do this a little bit differently than I normally would. So... Maybe it won't seem as magic, but maybe maybe some of the magic will still come through, all right? I picked out of the deck just 21 random cards. It doesn't really matter what they are. And what I would do for this trick, if you were physically present with me, I'll try to uh, replicate. Now, three columns of seven cards each. And what I would do is tell you, pick out any card in this. Just pick out a card and remember what that card is. And I'll tell you, just tell me which column, uh, right, center, or left, the, the card is in. Since you can't pick a card. And I'm just going to be sort of in on, on this with you. And so let, let's just, I know this seems strange, but... I'm going to pick the card, show it to you, and we'll see how it works out. So uh, let's just pick out what would be a good one here. Uh, let's do the Seven of Diamonds. All right, Seven of Diamonds. You like that? Is that good enough? I just picked a random one. It doesn't matter. And in fact, this a trick, it doesn't really matter if I know what the card is or not, because this card is going to magically appear at the end we'll see so normally i wouldn't know what the card is so i just ask you which column 
right, center, or left. And you'd say, oh, the left column. So I'd say, okay. So I'm going to pick up these uh, cards here. And I'm going to re redistribute them now in a new way. And your card might be in a different column this time. Probably will be because I'm uh, I kind of redistributed distributed them differently this time. So, uh, which column is it in now? And you would say, "Oh, why? It's in that right. It's in that right column there, right?" So I'd say, "Okay, cool." So then I'm gonna pick up the cards again. And then we'll redistribute uh, them one one final time here. And I would say, okay, which column is it in now? And he would say the center column. So again, I don't have to know what the card is or even look at the cards. I just uh, pick up the cards and now we're going to do something different here. I'm going to lay out the cards here in groups of four. And this is just a junk card. We know this isn't our card because uh, we can tell it's just a throwaway card. So let's see. If you were here physically present with me, I'd ask you to just pick three of these uh, groups here. But uh, since you're not here, I wasn't really even paying attention when I picked up the cards. And so I don't know. I, I, I don't know where our card is, so, but we're, it's going to magically appear here. So let's just pick three random groups. What uh, group should I pick? Uh, um, Let's just say the one, two, three, let's just kind of pick these. And I would say, okay, you picked uh, groups that your card is not in, so we're going to get rid of these here. Now I'll pick one group. You'd say, oh, the one closer to you? Okay, let's just uh, get rid of that. Now, I, I wish uh, you could be here for this, because I would tell you, okay, we have four cards left. But which one is your card? Well, you know what it is. So uh, I'd say pick two cards. And you'd say, okay, well, maybe the top and bottom or something. I'd say, okay, pick the, pick an, uh, another random card. You'd say, oh, the left one. Okay. And then I'd go like this and say, is this our card? Oh, yeah, it is. You pick, you pick the right one. It's much more magical when you yourself pick it out of the group. But there you have it. Now, a trick like that at first might make you say, wow. But what inevitably follows the wow are the words, how'd you do that? As a small child though, perhaps you never got past the wow stage. Maybe you never thought to ask, how did you do that? Why? Because you just took it in simple faith that it was magic. But as you got older, you realized that there is no magic. Everything has to be explainable. So sometimes it's hard for us just to say, wow. We want to understand how everything works. So we say, how? We know there's an explanation for how something works, usually in this world. But what about if a non-believing friend were to ask you, you Christians say you worship only one God, the one true God, you say, but you say that this God is also three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, if you ask me, your unbelieving friend might say, it sounds like you really worship three gods. 
How can there be one God but three persons? That just doesn't make sense. And so we search our brains to see if we can find some sort of example, some analogy that will help us make sense of this triune God. One God in three persons. So how about this apple? Some people say it's only one apple, but it's made up of, let's cut this open so we can see. It's made up of the, the peel on the outside that you see, the flesh, the part that's the best to eat, and then the core, the part with the seeds. Hmm, but it's just one apple, right? Well, that's not really satisfying, is it? We call that partialism, if we were to compare that to God. Because, after all, the core is just part of the apple. It's not the whole apple. And the core is nothing like the peel. And the fleshy part is juicy and delicious, but it's nothing like the peel. And so, we don't want to say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are just three parts of God that go together as one, but we say that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So the apple just doesn't really work to help us understand. So let's try a different analogy to help understand the Trinity. How about water? Water exists in three phases, solid, which we call ice, or as you can see, this dripping, it's already melting and turning into the liquid form that we call water, and gas, which if I were to heat this up, we would see the steam coming off of it, water vapor, the gas. Now, the solid, the liquid, the gas, it's all the same stuff, see? Ice is water, steam is water, water is water, of course. Just water in three different forms. And we use each one to do different things. We use water as liquid for drinking and cooking and washing. We use ice for cooling things down. We use steam to iron our clothing or clean things or even to power machinery like a steam engine. But it's all water. So that's kind of like God, right? The, the ice is water. The water is water. The steam is water. We could say the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But mwah, now that I think about it, that's not a perfect analogy either. You see, I can take one glass of water, like like this, and put it in the freezer to make ice. Of course, this is the ice that you're seeing. Then I can take the same glass of water and let it melt, and I have water again. Then I put the same glass in the microwave and add some energy into it, and it changes into steam. But God isn't really like that. The Father doesn't change into the Son, and the Son doesn't change into the Holy Spirit. Each person Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is God. Not just three different forms of the same God. We might call that modalism or different modes, phases. But instead, God is three persons that can be in the same place at the same time. The water analogy might be closer, but it's not perfect either. Well, maybe an analogy that seems closer is sunshine, the sun. There's the sun itself, the star, shining 94 million miles away from here. It's like the Father, huge, powerful, but mostly inaccessible to us. Then there's the light that radiates from the sun, the light that travels the 
94 million miles through the earth, through space, through the earth's atmosphere, and reaches all the way down to we are, so that the sunbeams bathe us in light. That's like Jesus. And even John, in his gospel, calls Jesus the light, who comes from the Father, and he is the sun shining upon the earth. And then there's the energy of the light hitting our skin, warming us up, maybe even to the point of making us sweat. And that energy, scientifically speaking, is energizing the molecules in our skin and our body to produce heat. And that's like the Holy Spirit who gives us life, who energizes and excites us to faith in Christ and motivates us to live out our faith. So there's the sun, the star itself, the visible light, and the energy that heats things up. Three different things, but in a sense, really, the one thing. It's energy. It's the sun. And if someone were to ask you why you're sweaty, you'd just say, well, because of the sun. You wouldn't explain the science of the energy exciting the molecules and all that stuff. Well, that's perhaps a workable analogy to the Holy Trinity, but it's still not perfect. And I could probably come up with several more examples to try to help us understand the mystery of the Holy Trinity. One God in three persons. But no, no earthly example seems to be perfect. I guess that's why we call it a mystery, because we just can't understand how it can be these simple human minds of ours. Now, the world thinks that we human beings can use a combination of science and our own brain power and creativity to solve any mystery, to fill in any blank, to know all that can be known in this world. But the world rejects the Bible and most religion because faith is about things that we can't see or prove with science. But we believe that just because science or even our human senses can't perceive or figure out something, that doesn't mean it still can't be real. Especially God and the truths that God teaches us through his word. And it would be nice if we could understand all the mysteries of God. And in heaven, we will understand much that we can't understand now. But we're never going to learn all that there is to know about God, even in eternity. One important lesson we're reminded of today in talking about the Holy Trinity is that we need to recognize that our wisdom is nothing compared to God's. When you think about it, there are a lot of things about the Christian faith that, that give us cause to, to scratch our heads and wonder. How can it be that splashing a person's head with water and speaking a few words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, can make a person into a child of God. How does baptism work? Only because God says so. But it doesn't really make sense to human logic. How is it that Jesus can give his body and his blood for us to eat and to drink, especially when all that we can see is bread and wine? It's a mystery. How can the words that I hear coming from the mouth of a pastor who's a human being just like me, how can those words be the very word of God? Especially when I hear those words, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How can God's forgiveness really come to me? It's hard to conceive of. How about when I fold my hands and, and close my eyes and, and bow my head 
and speak some words. Or maybe even just think them in my head, how can that be a prayer that ascends to heaven, to the Lord God Almighty, the King of heaven and earth? And how can he, on his heavenly throne, hear those little words of mine? How could he possibly pay attention to my little prayer when millions of others are praying it to him at the same time? It's something that we could never understand with our small little brains. In the end, all we can do is take God at his word and believe what he promises, that all these things are true, even if even when they don't make sense to us. The Holy Trinity, how God is one God and three persons, this is a mystery to us, no less a mystery than baptism or communion. There's only one God, but this God is the Father who sent, who not only created all this world, but also sent his Son, also God, into the world to save it. This God is also the Holy Spirit who gives us the faith to believe in Jesus and to receive eternal life. One God, three persons. And this God, the Holy Spirit tells us that we are children of God the Father because Jesus suffered and died for us. Okay, so maybe I can't really explain the one God, three persons thing. But what I can explain is that God the Father created all the world and everything in it. And then he gives you and me everything that we need from day to day and guards and protects us. I can tell you that God the Father sent his son Jesus into the world to save the world by dying on the cross. And I can tell you that Jesus promised never to leave us alone, but that he would be with us in the person of his Holy Spirit, the Counselor, the Comforter. The Holy Spirit will also remind us of all the things that Jesus taught and did, and remind us that we are dearly loved children of the Heavenly Father. But how these three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, can be one God, that I can't explain to you. This is a mystery that, that we'll leave for when we get to heaven. There God will explain everything to us and we will be able to understand many things that we do not know. It's also impossible for us to understand why this God loves us and why he gave up his only begotten son why he gave up his own life to give you and me life. Who has understood the mind of the Lord? The prophet Isaiah asks in chapter 40. Who has come to fully grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge? All we can say to God is, Lord, I don't understand, but give me the faith to believe and to be certain in my heart of your love for me, and that will be enough for me. Amen. And now may God's peace, which goes beyond all that we can understand, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In our prayers this weekend, we continue to pray for Jolene E. Now she is going to be undergoing some additional medical testing. We pray for Bruce Barron as he uh, continues to recover uh, from his uh, fall. And uh, he is uh, recovering at Linden Grove in Waukesha. So for God's healing for Bruce. And also for those that we continue to pray for long term that uh, the Lord would grant them the healing that they uh, seek. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. 
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord of hosts, your ways are inscrutable and your judgments unsearchable. Through your word, give us an ever-growing understanding of the depths of your riches, wisdom, and knowledge, that we may glorify you forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Bless the work of missionaries, both near and far, as they carry this gospel to the ends of the earth, that many may hear of your love and your Son, and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, have mercy on those who would deny the new birth of water and of the Spirit to infants and children. Open their eyes and hearts to the fullness of your grace, that they would no longer hinder these little ones from being born again and seeing your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, we give thanks for those who have served our nation through military service. And we remember with gratitude those who gave their lives for us and for the cause of freedom. Help us to honor their sacrifice by using our liberty responsibly. Keep safe all those who travel, bless our nation, and help us to protect and increase the privileges that we have for those who follow us, looking always to you from whom these privileges come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, uphold by your truth all those who suffer in our midst as they look to you for the healing that they need. Bless, heal, and strengthen Jolene as she undergoes tests, Bruce as he recovers, Kathy, Norma, Marion, Jane, Holly and her baby, Kurt, Jason, Marie, Dan, Jean, and Dave as they continue to look to you for the strength and the healing that they need each day. You are at their right hand. They cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, take away our guilt and atone for our sin by touching our unclean lips with Christ's cleansing body and blood that we may not be lost, but abide in your holy presence forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, dear Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we pray as Christ our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.